It's not that I have a problem with you being in the bed, but I did get up to make the coffee and I turn around and you have somehow right smack dab in the dead center right where I always, well, not where I sit, I actually sit right here, but pretty much right where I sit to watch morning YouTubes and you've taken over the whole bed. Hey, John, did you know it's Mother's Day? Did you tell uh, everybody who's a mother that's watching you right now, Happy Mother's Day? Happy Mother's Day from Jaw, guys. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, that is not the mural we're looking for, but I overshot it, and when I turned in to turn my car around, I saw this and I had to stop. Pretty nice. Looks like it's a school. Well, we're here. This is where the mural is. Well, I have a few rules I live by in life. I don't know if I've ever told you guys. One is I try not to drive during Terror Twilight, which is like that time of the day when the sun's going down and um, it's not quite dark, but it's not quite light out either. One of those other rules is I try not to drive on Sundays unless I'm working and making money because it is the worst time in Los Angeles to ever drive. The people are the worst. I was almost hit like five times on my way over here. It's terrible. And now we're here, we're actually to where we wanna be, the mural, and it's in maybe the busiest drive through parking lots in Los Angeles. But we're gonna do this anyway, because it's so worth seeing. Well, we made it over here, and this is kind of a big deal to me, because I told you guys yesterday that, uh, yesterday was actually Richie Valen's birthday, and, um, this 1959 Clear Lake, Iowa, quote unquote, the day the music died plane crash is actually like a huge deal to me. It's a huge deal in my life because even though I know I've mentioned to you guys that Guns N' Roses was kind of the defining moment when I realized I wanted to move to Los Angeles and pursue music, but it was actually seeing La Bamba and the Buddy Holly story and listening to their music um, that I could check out at my local library in Troy, Ohio that actually made me a fan and it made me want to learn guitar and when I first got a guitar and started learning guitar the first songs I learned were Buddy Holly, um, Every Day, Rave On, Peggy Sue and um, Richie Valens, Come On Let's Go, Donna, stuff like that. Um, but this has a really interesting story because I know a lot of you may know the story that basically how the plane crash happened was that all these guys were part of the Winter Dance Party Tour that was doing a uh, small tour across the uh, Midwest at like worst, the worst possible time of the year. As far as weather goes, the absolute worst possible time of the year. And um, Buddy Holly had broken up from the crickets. Richie Valens was 17 years old and um, was just breaking in. And then of course we had the big bopper. Now, Buddy Holly had broken up with the Cricket, so he actually didn't have a band, so he assembled a band to go on this thing. And one of the members he had was Waylon Jennings. He made him his bass player. He was a friend from Texas. And then he called up a guitar playing buddy of his named Tommy Alsup. And Tommy Alsup was part of the band as well. Now, Tommy was also given the, um, the task of finding a drummer for Buddy. And so they put together this band, went out for the uh, winter dance party tour. So a couple of nights before, when uh, they were playing, because the bus heaters were broken and the weather was so bad that it, what little heat they did have, you couldn't really, you couldn't really feel it. Um, Buddy's drummer actually had contracted frostbite and so he couldn't play. And um, so, and this is kind of new to me, I didn't know this, that Richie Valens and Buddy Holly had been trading off being each other's drummer the last couple of nights on this tour. But it, the weather had been insufferable and Buddy decided that the night of the uh, Clear Lake Iowa stop, February 2nd, he was gonna charter a plane get him to their next stop in Minnesota so they could do some laundry and just kind of get some relaxation, get some rest. And um, he, he actually had booked this for his band members. It was supposed to be Tommy Alsup, Waylon Jennings, and Buddy Holly on, on that plane. But what happened was 
The big bopper had had the flu for the last couple of days and was just feeling like garbage and needed some rest and he went up to Waylon Jennings and said, Waylon, do you mind if I take your spot on the plane? I gotta get some rest. And Waylon said, I don't mind if Buddy doesn't mind. So Buddy of course said okay. And um, kind of uncustomary of Buddy, um, the night of the crash, he tells Tommy, hey, can you go inside and see if we have any more gear that we forgot? And even Tommy said, that was kind of strange because you didn't have roadies back then. We were all responsible for our own gear and he had never said that to me. But he went back in and was in the green room and he ran into this guy signing an autograph. And Richie went up to Tommy and said, hey Tommy, what do you say? Can I take your spot on the plane? And Tommy reached in, pulled a coin out, said, we'll flip for it. And uh, Richie won the coin toss. So they boarded the plane, and shortly after, the plane crashed in a field in Clear Lake, Iowa. Now the reason I'm telling you this story is, I know everybody knows this story. This is probably maybe one of the most, most known stories of music tragedy. But here's a little twist of the story that makes it more interesting, is that a few years ago, where the Big Bopper's buried, they decided that they wanted to erect a life-size statue in honor of him at his gravesite. Now the issue became that J.P. Richardson, the Big Bopper, is buried in a section of the cemetery that is um, underground only. You cannot have any kind of plots above. And so what was gonna happen is for, in order for him to be able to accept, or his family to be able to accept the statue, they were gonna have to exhume his body and move him. And when this was kind of being talked about in play, his son decided, I have some questions, maybe this is the time to get answers. So his son called up a coroner that he had seen on TV do numerous cases and numerous things and thought this guy seemed to be about as respectable and honest as you could possibly get. And so he asked this guy, he said, would you, would you do an autopsy on my father? And so this guy said, okay. The reason that he wanted the autopsy is because the Big Bopper's son was in the womb while the Big Bopper died. And so he's never met him, um, but there were some questions because the Big Bopper's body was actually found on the opposite side of the fence where the plane crashed. which would make you, lead you to believe that he had been um, kind of trajected out of the airplane. But he was in the back left seat, like the driver's side, I guess you would say, the pilot side, the back seat. And so for him to be thrown out, it just seemed kind of peculiar. Now, the other thing is that shortly after the plane crash and a farmer who owned that field was going out and he was cleaning up some of the wreckage in order to be able to plant his upcoming crops, he found a gun and the gun had been fired a few times and it actually belonged to Buddy Holly. And ever since then, that had been kind of a question, I guess, in the Big Bopper's son's mind was, was my father shot? Um, or was my father on the other side of the fence because he, he had survived and was going for help. So they did exhume the body. The, uh, the guy who was doing the autopsy said he, when he lifted the lid, um, the big bopper was probably the best preserved body he'd ever seen. In the eight to 10 bodies that he had ever exhumed, he said the big bopper was by far in phenomenal condition. The son, being someone who had never met his father, he said he just sat there and stared and basically had like a, an internal conversation for about an hour staring at his father. And he said that um, he didn't want to do a normal autopsy where he's cutting the body open and looking at it in front of the family. So what he decided to do was he decided to do a, um, he decided to do what's called an x-ray autopsy and he x-rayed from the top of the skull to the bottom of the feet and what he realized was that he said there were probably over 200 fractures in that body and uh, said that <clears throat> both
both legs had been basically broken all the way across. Scrapes all over the face. Basically what you would expect out of airplane damage, but 200 different fractures in the body. Isn't that something? And uh, he said there was no gunshot wound and that it was very, very unlikely that it would have been possible for the big bopper to be able to <clears throat> get out and uh, make any kind of walk or any kind of effort for um, going for help. But I don't know that I'll ever get out to Clear Lake, Iowa to vlog this. And I know that this was supposed to be all about Richie, but it's about all of them. They will forever be intertwined in each other's history. And I just thought it was pretty important to come by and see this. Well, the drive home turned out to be just as dangerous as the drive there. Somehow we miraculously made it home in one piece. So I parked the car and I'm not moving it anymore today at all. This is, a, this is the equivalent, driving on a Sunday in Los Angeles to me is the equivalent of Shomer Shabbos for Walter and the Big Lebowski. Nothing good can come of being in a car behind the wheel in Los Angeles on a Sunday. I'm sure just what every mother wants to go to a yard sale on Mother's Day. I just slept for like five hours in the middle of the day. It's like seven o'clock now. Um, I'm, I gotta go get something to eat, but I don't know what I'm hungry for. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and live stream for you guys right now. I'm gonna make the announcement on Facebook as soon as I stop recording this and uh, gonna do a live stream then I'll go find something to eat so if you're watching the live stream or if you saw the live stream or if you didn't know there's a live stream there's gonna be one after this oh my god this is hilarious well we just did the live chat and I stopped in to get something to eat and my friend Kevin has a saying he goes no matter where you go if there's an open mic you will always hear the song wagon wheel if you go to a restaurant, you will always hear the song Wagon Wheel, and I'm sitting here, I take a bite of my sandwich, and then the first song that starts up is Wagon Wheel, so that's what I'm listening to. Mama rock me. Alright, good night, Lionhearts. I appreciate everybody that popped into the live chat today, and uh, for those of you that have been requesting for me to do another one, I hope that made you happy. Um, have a great night. Hope you had a great day with your mothers, if you were able to see them. Um, or talk to them. Hope you had a great time. And uh, until tomorrow, Hollywood, California, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion and your old pal Joss saying good night.